Uh, I'm Mark Mullins, I head up Treasury Management, but I'm here to really introduce the, the All-Stars today. These guys are here to, to give you some really, really good content to protect yourself. Uh, let me, these, they're credentialed enough I need to read. So Randy Wilburn, he's on my team, I actually work for him though. Uh, he heads up our Senior Product Management Area in Fraud Prevention Solutions. He's been with us for 25 years in the Financial Services area. He graduated from Tuskegee, got his MBA from the same place I got my undergraduate at Birmingham Southern. And then he's got his marketing and management degree from the University of Colorado in banking. So in just a second, I'll have you, uh, I'll introduce Randy. Jeff, raise your hand. Jeff is the vice president and assistant director of our region's bank uh, security team. So before us, he had a 26 year career with the United States Secret Service. I'm sure he's got a couple of nice uh, stories there. He's special agent in charge of the Birmingham office, but also spent time in St. Louis, Dallas, Washington, DC, London, and Toronto. Very good. Graduated from the University of Tennessee with a business administration degree. Please give a warm welcome for Randy Wilburn. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank everybody for being here uh, as well. All right, so before we get into this a little bit uh, and we go into the agenda, just let me say that, you know, as much as we try and get out in front of clients and share information about what other clients have seen in terms of fraud losses, this gives us a chance to tell you those same stories so that you won't become victims as well. Also, it gives us and our product management team a chance to hear about what's going on at your company, some of the problems that you have, so that we can build better products as well. So it's a give and take, and so if you have some of those ideas or questions uh, that come up, please don't hesitate to share those with us uh, during the question and answer session, or a couple of us will definitely be hanging around afterwards to take, that, uh, take any questions that you may have. In terms of the agenda, We'll spend a little bit of time just looking at background. I want to talk a little bit about how we got to where we are today in terms of fraud. You know, we've got some research that we've had a chance to get our hands on uh, from the American financial professionals. We always lean on their research, and it tells us what's happening in corporate America. So we'll spend a little bit of time going over some of those. Uh, and then we're going to look at some of the most popular uh, fraudulent schemes that we've seen. Now, keep in mind, when we're talking about these schemes, these, again, are some of the ones that we've seen other clients who become victims of. So we wanna make sure you know that, hey, here's what clients are becoming victims of, here's how it works, here's what you need to know about those. So we'll talk about bookkeeper fraud, we'll talk about business email compromise, ransomware, which is one we're hearing a whole lot about, uh, cyber fraud, check fraud, and of course, electronic payments fraud as well. And then I'll spend a little bit of time just talking about some of the most common solutions uh, that are out there in the market. <clears throat> so with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. In terms of a little bit of background in terms of where we are today, uh, the slide that I have here now just shows some headlines of some data breaches that actually happened in 2018. We've seen a whole lot more that took place in 2019, but I want to call out just a few of these. Uh, at the very top, you see the one for Facebook. In that particular case, they had 29 million users who had their data actually breached. That means that many of those users, their usernames, passwords, their favorite friends, the companies that they work for, their job position, all that information that we put out there on Life at Regions was breached and fell into the hands of fraudsters. And that was just one of the breaches that we talked about. We know that uh, Facebook had a separate one earlier this year as well. Another one that I'll call out, Google. 52.5 million one, and we know that Google had a couple of those breaches as well. So think about all the information that we put out there about ourselves on Google when we build our profiles. So think about that and kind of stick a pin in that because I'm going to come back to it and tie that to how this fraud is taking place as well. Not only is all of this fraud and data breaches taking place against internet-based companies like Facebook and Google, we also see companies down there like Marriott Hotels, brick and mortars. So, you know, all your preferences that you have, your credit card information, uh, some folks don't like to be near elevators, you know, they want to have certain kind of pillows, whatever it is, all that type of information that you trust with the company ended up into the hand of uh, fraudsters. The point is, data breaches have been taking place a long time. They're continuing to take place. I'll tell you about one that's even closer to home. 
the Equifax data breach that we heard about, guys? You know, we just heard recently, what's it gonna cost them? Something like $700 million to try and cure some of the damage that's being done. And even what's dangerous about that, that we don't think about, the data that those fraudsters got, we don't know where it is today. We don't know if it's on the dark net someplace. It could come up for sale next month, next year, five years from now. It could be someone who's using that information to apply for credit in our names, and we won't know about it. So when that data is breached and gets into the hands of fraudsters, we're not sure what's gonna happen. So we have to be very vigilant to make sure it doesn't get breached in the first place. Now, in terms of some trends that we've seen out there, again, I mentioned that we work closely with uh, AFP and they conduct a survey every year. And we always take a look at that information so we can get a good idea about how fraud has impacted the corporations including a lot of the corporations that we serve in our uh, footprint as well. So there are a couple of things I want to call out here. You'll see that top yellow line. And, and let me step back here. This particular survey here represents companies that had fraud for the ones who actually responded to it. They asked these companies, have you had fraud, number one, yes or no? And if you have had fraud, what type of payment fraud was it? So each one of those lines that you see up there represents a particular company that had payment fraud, whether the uh, perpetrator was successful or not. With that in mind, let's call out a couple of these. At the very top, you see that yellow line up there. That particular one represents check fraud, okay? Check fraud. What that means is that for these companies who responded to that survey and they had fraudulent attempts against them, the highest volume were fraudsters who tried to use check fraud to steal money from them, counterfeit, counterfeit checks or for, uh, forfeitures or whatever, uh, but it was check fraud that was being used. That's in terms of volume, okay, not dollar amount. We usually get that question, does this represent dollars or volume amounts? This represents volumes. The next one I want to call out is that orange one that you'll see that represents wire transfer. You'll see that that number uh, really started to take off in 2015, and that's related specifically to business email compromise, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. And we call that in the category of wire fraud, but really we're talking about a fraudster who's trying to convince somebody to send a wire transfer to somebody else. But we still kind of refer to it as wire fraud as well. Uh, the last thing I point out on this particular slide, you'll see the ones that relate it to ACH. And we separated them on this particular one between ACH debits and ACH credits. But here's something to take notice of. If we actually combine the volume that we saw for ACH debits and credits, ACH would be a much higher number than it is represented on here. So again, keep in mind that fraudsters, when they get started out, the easiest way for them to commit fraud against your companies is with paper checks from a volume perspective. The trend that we've been seeing lately is wire transfer related fraud on the business email compromise. So then the question that we get is, so why do fraudsters target our commercial accounts. Pretty simple. Uh, we say that's what a high balance uh, checking accounts are. I'll, I'll tell it to you another way. You know, if you look at a personal account, my account, and compare it to your company's account, there's a big difference. In fact, there's a very big difference. <laughs> uh, and then not only that, you know, the commercial accounts have some tools that we don't have on the consumer side. Your commercial accounts that have tools like wire transfer, the ability to send ACH, we don't normally have those type of tools on our consumer accounts as well. Now, there's something else that fraudsters will target your accounts for uh, at your company, and it's really related to the data. Think about the laptops that you have at your jobs. You could very easily have a list of customers, list of vendors, uh, their first name, last name, their address, their social security number, all that payment information, routing and transit number, bank account number, all of this type of information could be on your desktop or your laptop at any particular time. We know that fraudsters know that information is very valuable because they'll try to get it, sell it on the dark net, or try and use it to take money from your client's account or your vendor's account. So that's why they are targeting commercial accounts as well as the information and data that you have. In light of all of this taking place, here's what we all agree on. Education is definitely the key to combating everything that we're seeing. So at your company, there should be somebody who's asking questions like, are you losing revenue to fraud? Are you keeping information private? Are your vendors legitimate? That's very important nowadays. Are your internal controls strong enough 
somebody at your company should be asking questions like that to make sure that you're protected from becoming a victim of fraud. So we'll start going to a few of these schemes that we're seeing out there before I get to those schemes. Uh, one of the things that we see a lot uh, has to do with document protection. And when we're talking about document protection, we're really just saying that there needs to be a business-wide process in place to protect the documents that are at your company. Now, I'll give you an example. Here at the bank, uh, every associate pretty much has two trash receptacles at their workstation. There's one that's black, there's one that's blue. Uh, for the black one, we use that to just throw away regular trash that could probably be recycled or something like that. It doesn't have any sensitive information on it. But there's also a blue receptacle. That's the one that may have some sensitive customer information on it. For the black receptacle, the normal cleaning crew will come through and they'll empty that at the end of the day, okay? And they have their process. But for that blue one, we have a company that we partner with who comes in to empty those particular trash cans. They have to make sure that whatever is in those trash cans is destroyed in the right way, okay? And make sure it's totally destroyed because it could have sensitive information on it. My point is you should have a process in place at your company to make sure that any information and documentation that you discard, that you're managing, is taken care of in the right way, all right? So now let's kind of shift gears a little bit and get to some of the payment fraud schemes that we've seen out there. Uh, there are several that we're going to cover. Uh, the first one we're going to take a look at is going to be bookkeeper fraud. Uh, this particular one arises from whenever we see one person at the company who has a tremendous amount of control. In other words, that person may be able to send a payment from beginning to end. They can initiate the payment, approve the payment. They can also release that payment to the bank so that it can be processed. Uh, and we need, normally call that bookkeeper fraud when uh, that type of thing takes place. In fact, what we've seen is that uh, when bookkeeper fraud takes place, 85% of the people who actually committed were actually a trusted employee at that company. In other words, it's somebody who's been at that company a long time, almost like family, particularly with a lot of the mid-sized and smaller companies where they just don't have a whole lot of resources uh, there. We've seen some of these folks who would create a bogus account and begin paying themselves. Uh, we've seen them open up an account that could be in a company's name similar to the company that they work for. And when they receive those checks in for accounts receivables, instead of depositing that checks into their employer's account, they would deposit those checks into another account. Uh, we've seen some of them who would actually change, set up someone else, uh, uh, one of their vendors. And so when the vendor payments go out, they would intercept those checks and pay themselves. So we've seen a lot of bookkeeper fraud that take place as well. Uh, one example that we had, there was a CPA firm who was actually doing the books for a company and set up an employee, and they basically continued to pay this false employee for years and years. Over five years, they paid over $250,000 to that employee before they were finally caught. Uh, once they caught up with them, they did prosecute them, and that person is now doing uh, prison time for that. We've also seen some red flags out there. We've seen that a lot of times when it takes place, this person usually lives be, uh, beyond their means. And a lot of times it could be someone who's had financial difficulties. For example, it could be one where there are two incomes in the household and one person loses their job and now all of a sudden you just have that one income. Or it could be a case where they had a medical condition and they just couldn't bounce back from the expenses that come along with medical conditions. We've seen that they're usually pretty closely associated with their vendors and they have excessive control issues as well. But there are also a couple of uh, good practices that we've seen to help prevent bookkeeper fraud. Never sign blank checks. You know, the fact that we even have to say that means that we have a lot of folks out there who are just signing blank checks and leaving them in the office. So we need to make sure that folks aren't signing blank checks. Establishing dual control is always important as well. And making sure that the employees are aware of whatever process is in place and that you actually test that process from time to time and implement an approval process for new vendors. I know here at the bank, you know, there's always someone who's in charge of the relationship for a vendor, and we have to complete a report on those v uh, vendors, sometimes two and three times a year. But there needs to be someone at the company who's done that for you uh, as well. Uh, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jeff to come and talk to us a little bit about what's going on from a corporate security <clears throat> perspective. Thank you, Randy. Sure. Uh, just so you guys know, we're corporate security, and I'm going to go over about five or six slides on this, but this is the Treasury Management's uh, presentation, and they do a great job. Many times we, I don't say we joke, but we talk in corporate security that we're the backstop. 
They're the ones that take care of this problem and try to prevent the problem before it becomes a problem. After the ball has gotten past the catcher, that's when corporate security steps in and we try to, we try to fix the problem or mitigate it. Um, I also want to thank all you in the room um, and Mark Mullins for the introduction. It's football time in Alabama, and when he mentioned I was from the University of Tennessee, none of you giggled. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, corporate security. We have 121 associates throughout our footprint. Uh, we're in 35 different offices throughout our footprint as well, 64 investigators. And we cover uh, we're a wide range of group. We got federal investigators, we got federal prosecutors, we got former local and state law enforcement. So we've covered the gamut. And many times we might not have the answer to help you with your problem, but based on our background, we might be able to find the person who can help you with your problem. We say that a lot of times the value we'll bring to a situation is not what we know, but it might be our Rolodex of who we know and how we can help you. Um, as you can see, 397 cases last year with a net loss of over $10,000. One of the things that's not on the slide was we also do a pretty good job of trying to recover money for our clients. In, 20, in 2018, we recovered over $387,000 for our clients. So we, we try to be involved in not only what we do to arrest perpetrators and work with our law enforcement, but we also want to try to get the money back for you. Business email compromise, Mark talked about this earlier, uh, the staggering numbers that go along with business email compromise. What is it? Pretty simple. It's a fraudster trying to get access to the person at a company who has control of the checkbook. Now, they can do that through uh, bogus emails coming in, malicious software they put on your uh, computer. They can do it by uh, phishing scams where they try to get you to click on something on an email they send to you. Any way that they can try to gain access to your funds and try to trick you into sending funds to them. I came to corporate security five years ago. My first week on the job, I learned of a case that, we, that had just occurred to us, just happened. A CEO of a company takes a mission trip over to, to China. While he's there, we're assuming that he must have had his phone hacked or something, but while he's there, the CFO of the company gets an email, says, look, I've got a deal here in China that I'm working on, and I need you to wire me $60,000. And he said, I've got a contact, a lawyer, that I want you to reach out and talk to, and he'll tell you the details of that. So they reached out, talked to the, he re, the CFO, reached out to this lawyer, talked to them, and negotiated a deal for $60,000 being wired over. That's a bad story. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. Three days later, the CFO got another email saying that's great, the first part of the deal's been taken care of, let's complete the deal now, wire $600,000 over, and we'll take care of this. The CFO did follow those instructions. About seven days later, the CEO comes home, CFO asks him, how'd the deal go? And you can kind of figure out what the rest of the story was from there. And as much as we, in corporate security will try to help out in something like that and try to get that money back seven days later foreign country probably not getting it back and they didn't get it back in this situation again how do they get access you can read them up there and I think most of you probably know but even with that being the case we're all still we feel like we're all aware but keep in mind, we're all capable of clicking on that email or that web link when we're not supposed to. So be careful and try to have safeguards in place. You can see in my slide all the different ways, try to set up protocols for 
how you respond to emails, what you don't click on, try to have your information security people set up channels and ways that these type of emails don't get through. But the last item on there is the key one that I want to bring up. Don't rely on email alone, okay? If, it, if you take nothing else away from this, take that back to your companies. Don't rely on email because in my example that I gave in, uh, of the fraud that took place when the CEO went to China, if a phone call could have been made or even just talking to someone else within the company and say, look, I just got this, they could have gone to extra channels, extra methods to try to take care of this problem. So don't rely on email alone. You'll see the other one right before that says use forward instead of reply. I learned this myself not too long ago. Anybody know why you would do that? Well, the reason why is because when you use forward, then, you're put, then you type an email in there, and it comes from your contact list then. So you might think you're replying to someone that you know that's on your contact list, but if you put forward in, then it comes from your known contacts, and you have a better chance of it not taking place. And keep in mind, we talk about business email compromise. This can happen to individuals as well. We've had numerous instances where people will be going to a real estate closing and they'll end up getting an email for what they think is the closing attorney saying, please send the payment for your close to this email or to this account, please wire it. And it ends up going to the bogus account. And they show up at the closing and said, I sent, I wired the money like you asked. And then they find out that it wasn't take, it, it didn't happen that way. Ransomware. Corporate security really will not probably get involved in ransomware because it's something that will happen outside of our realm. But again, I mentioned this to you and I want to talk to you a little bit about it because it's something that we're seeing more and more of. And as Jeff said, it's probably a lot more than what we realize because no one wants to raise their hand and say, I've been a victim of ransomware. What is ransomware? That's when a fraudster gets access to your data or your system and says, unless you pay me, usually in Bitcoin, I'm not going to release that to you. And we're seeing it more and more. It's interesting, um, in the United States, the data says that about 3% of U.S. companies will pay the ransom. But in a place like Canada, the data says that 75% of the people will pay the, will pay the ransomware. I don't know what that says about us as a as a country or but um, many times I think we and you, you will see this or we'll see historically you'll see this you probably would have been better off paying the ransomware and I'll use an example of the city of Atlanta in March of 2018 they got a ransomware attack where the uh, the fraudster demanded payment of fifty one thousand dollars and they would unlock the city of rant city of Atlanta's data the city of Atlanta decided not to pay that ransomware and they ended up paying over 17 million dollars to try to get the data replaced and get their system back to where it was before the attack but it's something that we see quite a bit um, again more prevalent than what you probably realize and it's the, it seems to be where business email compromise is kind of the crime of the day if you will that ransomware is starting to move into that realm. A friend of mine told me, said, uh, when I told him I was going to talk a little bit about ransomware, he said, well, tell them if they're using Yelp and it says, and they're putting in the Yelp search engine a financial forensics examiner, it said it's too late. Or if you're putting into Google how to purchase Bitcoin, it's probably too late because that's what they're going to use for payment. Is it going to be Bitcoin? And they're going to be, you're going to be going to a forensic computer analysis to try to get your, your computer fixed. But again, it's going to be too late by that time. How do they set it up? It's really it's very similar how they'll set up ransomware to a business email compromise. They're going to try to affect your system. They're going to try to get in by any way they can. Malware, malicious emails. Again, protect what's coming into your company and protect what you click on. Helpful practices regarding ransomware. The most important is back up your data. Many times if you back up your data, it doesn't matter 
that they can lock down your initial data because you've got a second copy. That's the most important thing. And again, you'll see the other thing. Oh, remove unnecessary uh, applications off your computer and your system. Many times, you know, as we know on our iPhones, I'm going to use that as an example, we'll download applications, they'll stay on there forever, and you never use them anymore. Well, companies do the same thing. They have applications, vendors that they're using, but they don't remove them. Remove those, because that's just another avenue where someone can get into your, uh, your corporation's uh, technology, and next thing you know, you're going through a ransomware. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking about cyber fraud. Um, <clears throat> we kind of hear this term a lot out there, and, and so I just want you to walk away having a better understanding about what's going on when we talk about this cyber fraud and, and, and a little bit of understanding about that. Um, here's, what, here's what we know about that. You know, there's this malware, and, and we know there are viruses that get downloaded into your computers at your companies and sometimes your personal ones as well. So the question that we, we normally get is, you know, where is this malware coming from and who's creating it? From what we've seen, uh, we see that this malware is created in parts of Russia. Uh, we're also seeing that it's coming from some parts of China as well, even more and more here lately. Uh, and then what we know is that the people who design and build this uh, malware, uh, they put it up for sale on the dark net. Show of hand of who all is familiar with the dark net or the underground internet. I'm seeing about 10 or 15 percent uh, of the people here. I'm not sure what we're seeing out there, the audience. So I'll talk about it just a little bit. Uh, when we're talking about the dark net, you know, you see this sentence on here that says, uh, Department of Homeland Security and the FBI says that we're only really using about 10 percent of the internet and that other 90 percent out there could potentially rep represent the dark net. So think about it like this guys. When, when we use our browsers, uh, Chrome, uh, IE, uh, Firefox, help me out, what am I missing? Some of the other uh, browsers that are out there, it's only allowing you to search about 10 percent of the internet that's out there. That's because the Producers of those browsers believe that the rest of the internet is not safe. It's easy for you to pick up viruses and so forth. And, but that's also places where fraudsters and people go to sell malware and they can get on your computer really easy if you go there. Not only is that on uh, that dark net place, but for those sites out there that are selling viruses and malware, they're also selling a whole lot of other things out there. They're selling drugs, they're selling guns, they're selling, selling hitmen. Whatever it is that you could think of a fraudster as needing is also for sale uh, that's out there uh, on the dark net. And I'll tell you something else uh, that's about it. You know, I had a chance to hear some other folks speak a couple uh, months back. And so even though you know that people go out there and they hire a hitman, and you hear about a lot of times somebody would hire a hitman, but they were actually talking to an FBI agent or something like that. What these guys are doing nowadays, you just can't go to the dark net on day one and hire a hitman. You gotta start out really small. Maybe you buy some credit card numbers or maybe you buy some drugs or something like that. And they usually have a rating system, kinda like they have on Amazon or eBay where they say this buyer has a rating of five stars or whatever it is, or this seller has a rating of four stars. But anyway, as your rating go up, then shopping on the dark net, you're able to buy more and more dangerous types of things out there. So there's a different world that's out there on the dark net. You'll hear about that a lot of times. That's where a lot of times the malware is for sale. Uh, years ago, folks who were buying things out there on the dark net, they would use Bitcoin. That's before Bitcoin became as popular as it is now. Uh, for those of you who follow Bitcoin pretty closely, you know it's pretty close to impossible for knowing who the actual owner is of a share of Bitcoin. That was one of the beauties of it. You can actually go out there and buy things and they wouldn't know who you were. Uh, but they were doing a whole lot of that type of commerce on the dark net. Uh, I'll say this as well. You know, a lot of people think that folks who are selling malware and things like that, it's usually maybe some kids in the basement and things like that. But here's what we've seen. These guys are very sophisticated. In some cases, we know that if you are a fraudster and you've bought a virus and you can't get it to work right, there is an 800, well, I don't know if it's an 800 number, but there's a number you can call. And they'll actually assist you to get your virus to work right. The point is they're very sophisticated, not like a lot of us think. So that's that dark net, that dark web uh, that's out there as well. So we know it's out there, we know it's prevalent, we know it takes place a whole lot. Uh, then the next question should be, for these fraudsters who've gotten their hands onto this malware, how is it that they get it onto our computers? or onto the computers of our corporations. 
from what we've seen, they're using a lot of the tactics like spear fishing and fishing. A lot of you guys have heard about those uh, type of uh, attacks that take place. We know they also use some of those rotating banner ads. Uh, they call malvertising, which is kind of like a combination of malware and advertising. You'll see those ads. I always recommend that people do not click on any of those ads that you'll see on some of those sites. If there's an ad and it has a product that you are really interested in, I recommend you go to your address bar, type in the address that goes directly to that company, and then try and search for that particular product, but do not click on those ads that you see out there. Uh, keep in mind, they're just basically trying to get you to click on some of those so they can get the malware onto your uh, computer. Uh, also, what we've seen, I know I was talking to someone earlier, we were talking about emails that they've gotten. We've had some clients who've gotten emails that seem like they came from the IRS. It could be an email that say, uh, we have not received your quarterly tax payment. Uh, please click on the link below to get information about the payment we have not received and the potential penalty. So you'll have a person who's really concerned now, all of a sudden they're ready to click on that link. We've seen some other clients who've received emails that look like they came from UPS. We have a package that if you don't claim it, it's going to be returned in 24 hours. Click on this link to get more information about this particular package. Again, they're trying to get you to click on that particular link. Not only have we seen them in emails that are going to corporations uh, like yours, uh, we've also seen them on social media as well, you know, in your inbox or direct messenger, DM as they call it, uh, where folks would hack into your friend's account and they'll send you these uh, pictures and videos and all, all those types of things. My favorite one is the one where they send to people and say, hey, here's some pictures from the party last night. You know, and if you're like me, you probably didn't know about the party. Definitely didn't get invited to the party. <laughs> but uh, you want to see the pictures from the party last night, right? Everybody wants to see pictures from the party last night. So uh, we've seen these fraudsters get really clever about trying to get people to click on uh, those types of things and get that viruses downloaded onto their system. So just be real vigilant about those things, even on social network. Uh, be careful about what you click on. You know, fraudsters, look, they know how to play on our emotions, guys. They know what to do. They know what to say. They know what kind of things uh, that really gets our attention. So we know that that's how they try and get that uh, software uh, and malware uh, downloaded to our computers. So right here, uh, let's just assume that somebody at your company has received one of these emails and they've actually clicked on one of those links, okay? So we used to get this question, so what happens? How does that process look? So I'm gonna try and take you through a little bit of that. So assume that you're the client and, and, uh, and then there's an email that comes through where you see a big at sign there. Uh, and attached to that is a link in there. When they click on that, the rootkit begins to install. It's a rootkit because it's not a whole lot of code. It could be on a picture or a video and it immediately begins downloaded into your subdirectories in your computer, a lot of time unbeknownst to you. Uh, and once it's there, it actually sends a message back to the control server and say, hey, I'm here. Someone has clicked on the link in the email that you sent. Go ahead and download the rest of the code for the virus. Okay, and so now this rootkits begin to build out and whatever the virus is begins to receive the rest of the code so they can do some things there as well. Uh, many times we've seen that when that virus is downloaded to your computer at your company, there's usually like an icon that's in your cradle that will make it seem like your system is protected. But we know that sometimes those viruses can actually disable that little icon so it looks like you're protected, but you really are not. Meanwhile, you're still sitting there working and it's downloading uh, onto your system. Uh, we've seen some cases where a very popular one is to call a key logging software. So the way that particular one works is basically, it basically measures and monitors all of the keys that you type in and sends it back to the fraudster. So think about this guy. So if you go to the address bar and you type in www.abcbank.com, that information is going back to the fraudster. So key logger is logging all your keystrokes. In real time, you tab down and you type in your username. It goes to the fraudster. Tab down, type in your password, it goes to the fraudster as well. So in pretty much real time, a fraudster who's monitoring what's going on can see that, hey, that guy who clicked on the link, the key logging software is doing what it's supposed to do. He just went to a bank site. Here's the information that he used to log in. He knows this in just about real time. And what he can do 
if he's able, he can actually go to that same site and use your credentials uh, and log on as you. Now, a lot of times, you know, banks, I know that we have, and some others have as well, try to use some things that make sure that you have uh, dual authentication or at least multi-factor authentication so that not only do you need your username and password, but you have to use another device to confirm that you are who you are when you're logging on so that you can try and get around cases like that. But we know that that takes place. But if you're not being uh, vigilant and the fraudster is able to get control of your account, there are a couple of things you need to keep in mind. Uh, that fraudster is going to be able to use any rights and privileges that are assigned to you. So think back to that example where I talked about bookkeeper fraud, that one person who has the ability to send a wire, approve a wire, and release a wire. If he gets into your system using your credentials and you have all those rights assigned to you, that fraudster can do all of those things. Same thing with ACH. Back when we talked about dual control, we we're talking about having more than one person do all those, have at least two or three in those three steps that I just talked about. Then once they get in, they try to move money. That's the big thing they try to do. And they try to move those funds to the account that belongs to a money mule. Show of hand of who's familiar with the money mule? One, here. Okay, so that means we gotta talk about it. Uh, so money mules are, are these people who actually take part in that process of stealing money from your company's account to get into the accounts belonging to the fraudster. Sometimes if they are aware of it, sometimes they may not be aware. And so these are also guys who kind of respond to some of these ads that you may see on some of these sites like monster.com, career builder. And I know there are some legitimate jobs out there at Wells, but we, know that we also know that fraudsters use these sites too. And there'll be those ads that say, hey, you know, make $20,000 a week from your home doing nothing. And you have this person who says, yes, that's the job I prayed for. <laughs> and so they would get those jobs. The froster would basically contact them and say, hey, I'm going to have some money sent to your account. You keep 5,000 of it, send the rest of it to this account in China or wherever it is. And now that money is out of the country. These are the money mules. Now, the peculiar thing about the money mules, and, and Jeff can speak to this better than I can, is, you know, by the time we start doing an investigation to figure out the money left your business account, it goes to the money mule, then it's gone to China or someplace like that, they start to interview the money mule. They ask them, hey, you know, why did you participate in this fraudulent scheme? Do you know what you were doing? They say, no, you know, I just got this job and I love it. Do you know what you were doing? You know, and they have to figure out, did this person willfully participate in a scheme or if it's someone who's just gullible? you know, so they could press charges and so forth. But those are the money mules, so let's make sure we know who those people are. Uh, in terms of some helpful practices to avoid some of these schemes, uh, dual control, you know, I mentioned it a couple of times, but let's make sure we understand what I'm talking about that. When we're talking about that payment process that takes place at every company in here, we know that there are usually three steps. There's someone who's going to initiate that payment. That's where they're gonna enter the first name, last name, uh, routing number, account number, of whoever it is they're paying, or if it's a vendor. We know that someone has to approve it, and we know that someone has to release it to the bank. Releasing it to the bank saying, hey, Regents or ACH or ABC Bank, we want you to take this payment request and process it. Send a wire or ACH or whatever it is. Dual control says, instead of having one person in, in charge of all three of those steps, maybe have two or three if you can. One person to initiate it, a separate person to approve it, and a third person, if possible, to release it or use that first person, as long as there's more than just one. That can apply for wires and ACH. Uh, daily reconcilement, that's important. You know, if there are some checks that posted your account uh, last night and you log on that next morning and you don't recognize those accounts, those checks, the best thing you can do is let the bank know as soon as possible, because the sooner we know, the better position that we are in to help prevent a loss from taking place. Okay, so daily reconcilement is critical. Somebody at your company know what transactions have taken place against your account. Uh, secure environment, we've seen some clients who find it important to just have one computer that's used for initiating payments. Uh, here at the bank, you know, uh, for example, web surfing, you know, there are a lot of sites that we cannot go to as employees. Uh, many times if you go to a site that you're not supposed to uh, go to, you'll see this big green hand. Uh, and you know, the first time you'll see the green hand, but there's some language underneath it that says, you know, if you really need to get here to this site, let us know. But at the end of it, it says, you know, subject to termination. And uh, anytime you see that, you start hitting escape immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So the point is you need to have something in place. You don't have to have a green hand, but you need to have something uh, in place. Uh, using strong passwords, uh, we always recommend uh, eight digit password, alphanumeric, uh, that are changed at least every 60 days. Do not use birthdays and uh, pet names. Uh, quick quiz for everybody, and uh, for some of you I know who know the answers to this because you've heard me ask before, please don't answer. But uh, what do you think is the number one used password that's out there today? Password, yeah. Okay, what's number two? One, two, three, four, we're on a roll, number three. ABC, who was that? Yeah, it was close. It's QWERTY. Those uh, keys at the top uh, level on your uh, keyboard. Those are the top three uh, passwords that are being used. Here's the thing about that. We know that now. The frosters also know that. So when you use passwords, make sure you aren't using any of those, or any passwords that are easy to guess. Here's the other thing that frosters know about us. They know that we use the same password over and over again. So earlier when I talked about that data breaches that took place at places like Facebook and Google and Marriott Hotels, and if they're able to get passwords, and they are somehow able to find out from Facebook that I am the accounts payable manager at ABC Company, and they know that we have a tendency to use the same password over and over again, there are algorithms out there once they have your email address, and it's easy to get that. Any time you sign up for some of these conferences and you're giving your email address, and you know they can get that information online. There are algorithms that can just ping different companies' website and assume that this person who uses password for their password at Facebook may also use password for their password at work to try and get into their systems. So let's not use easy passwords uh, as well. And then, of course, making sure that we don't click on um, links when we see those. Uh, a little bit on check fraud. Uh, the only thing I'm going to call out here is that if what we've seen a lot of losses take place uh, are around alterations and uh, counterfeits. So when we're talking about alterations, we're talking about a check that was written for $100 and someone changes it to 1000 or that check was made payable to Randy Wilborn and someone changes it to Randy Wilborn or John Doe. In terms of counterfeit checks, where we've seen losses there too, we're talking about people who are just basically creating a check that looks just like a check that your company would issue. You know, if you think about it, if you were still paying people with check when you hand that check to the pizza guy or whoever it is, you're giving them an idea of what your check stock looks like. Uh, you're giving them your account number. You're giving them your routing and transit number. You're giving them an idea of what the signature looks like on that check too. So right now it's kind of easy to go down to Office Depot or some of those places and buy a color printer, to, color printer or even order check stock online. You can order anything online uh, nowadays and recreate a check uh, that looks like it comes from your company. So when we saw that chart at the very beginning that said check fraud in terms of volume was higher than any of those other payment methods. That's one of the reasons why it's really easy to do, and these are two of the reasons uh, why it takes place. Uh, show of hand, who knows what positive pay is? Oh, good. I'm so happy we saw a lot of hands in here. Um, just quickly, and I won't go through all these, but you know, at the end of the day, positive pay is doing nothing more than comparing the pay name uh, the dollar amount that you say, and also the check serial number. Clients tell us those information, we compare them. If they're different, we'll tell them, hey, there's an exception. But positive pay is one of the best tools that's used in the industry to help prevent check fraud like I just talked about. Uh, a couple helpful practices uh, that we talked about, converting paper to electronic. In other words, instead of paying someone with a paper check, we recommend using ACH when you can. Uh, securely storing those checks, not leaving them on an open desk. Uh, using stop payments when you have to, using services like positive pay uh, for checks and for ACH as well. Uh, and also employee education. You know, it's important to have people like you here uh, to hear about some of the things that we're seeing, but it's even more important to have some of the folks who are at your job who play an important role uh, in this process every day to know about the fraudulent techniques that are taking place uh, out there too. Uh, a little bit on electronic payment frauds. Uh, we kind of talked about the wire piece already uh, when Jeff talked about business email compromise. But the piece I wanted to call out here was around ACH fraud. And we're really talking about unauthorized debits against your account. 
you know, guys, keep in mind that when it comes to ACH, you, the two critical pieces are really the account number and the routing and transit number. And where can you find that information? That's right, on the check. That information is on the check. That is the critical information for ACH transactions. And a lot of people have that information. So make sure you have something in place to make sure that you aren't going to uh, put yourself in a position to become a victim. Uh, electronic payment frauds helpful practices. Uh, using solutions like debit blocks and filters, uh, using separate accounts for deposit versus uh, disbursements. Uh, ACH positive pay is a good one as well. Uh, you know, on this other side, you'll see the ones about using dedicated PCs. You know, for some of the smaller companies, that may make sense, but we, we understand that some of the bigger companies, that's not always easy to do. Uh, we always talk about dual control, always have to reiterate, reiterate that one uh, as well. Uh, now, in terms of electronic payment, like the ACH unauthorized debits I talked about. Most of your banks are going to have a solution that allows you to know what debits hit your account so that you can review those and let them know if there are some of those are fraudulent. We have those types of solutions. I know uh, many other banks do as well. Uh, and then here at the end, uh, we had a lot of clients who would say, well, now that we've covered a whole lot of information here, uh, what do I need to do? And so I kind of put together this checklist so that you can take it back with you and basically go through this and get with a group of people at your companies and just ask yourself some of these questions about your company if it's not already taking place. You know, do you sign blank checks? Do you restrict employees to accounting systems? Uh, do you uh, click on links in suspicious emails? Uh, do you use positive pay? All of these types of questions are designed to help you think through that process to see if you're really prepared to uh, not become a victim of some of the fraud schemes uh, that we uh, see out there. We've covered a whole lot of information pretty quickly here. Uh, I want to try and save some time for some questions. We do have one question. Uh, every time there is fraud, does it mean that I have malware on my machine? In other words, can I still be a BEC victim if my system is clean? Okay. I'll take it. Sure. Uh, obviously you can because many times it can be done through social engineering. It could be someone calling in and gaining the trust of the employee. Uh, it doesn't have to be something on the, uh, through the internet or through an email. That is the most common, but it doesn't have to be, no. Right, and, and Jeff, the only thing I'll add to that uh, under the uh, business uh, email compromise umbrella, you know, we're starting to see more and more, at least hear about more and more of these uh, companies who have employees uh, who do not receive their checks on payday. So in other words, it's been a case where someone else has somehow gotten a hold of their information, contact their HR department and basically said, I want to change or I've changed banks that I'm, you know, getting my pay on. Could you please begin sending my future payments uh, to this new bank account number and route and transit number? And not only uh, are we seeing them using other banks, we're also seeing them in some cases using gift cards, if you will, uh, to receive that. In fact, about 65 percent of the folks uh, who were saying they were victims of uh, business email compromise on the consumer side has said that um, gift cards had been used in a lot of those cases. But yeah, uh, Jeff is absolutely right. Just because they uh, have that on their computer does not mean that that's the case. Yeah, and let me remind everyone, if you have a question, text that question to TM Product at 22333. I think Randy covered that in the housekeeping. Uh, another question, Randy, we have is you talked about positive pay but can you share any insight in terms of how new technology may impact how positive pay works? Um, sure. Uh, positive pay has been around for a while. You know, I, I had a slide up there that showed the several different flavors uh, that, that we have. Uh, and each one of those flavors have kind of evolved, uh, Jeff, based on uh, customers' need. You know, one, one of the more recent ones was one that we call No Check Positive Pay because there were clients who basically said we had accounts that we don't write checks on, but if there's a fraudulent check or a counterfeit check that hits this account, we just want you to return it. And that actually came from groups like this, and that was called uh, No Check Positive Pay. Uh, but what we're starting to see is that because of technology, uh, some clients may not always want to send us what's called a check issue file, which is something that's critical so that we know what checks are being issued so that we can do that comparison I talked about a little while ago where I say we compare the check serial number, the dollar amount, uh, and the pay name. There are some clients who don't want to do that. Uh, so we've seen some things such as some of them who use like a QR uh, code uh, on the front of their checks. And so instead of printing the MICR information at the bottom that has the account number, the routing and transit number that I referenced a little while ago, 
uh, that information would be in that QR code. So the client will know what's on that check and the bank or the receiving institution would be able to read and interpret that QR code. So if you give that check to the pizza guy, and I'm not picking on pizza guys here, but if you give that uh, check to the pizza guy or whoever it is, they won't be able to look at it with their eyes and know what your account number is or know what that routing and tra uh, transit number is on that particular check or to originate that unauthorized ACH debit against your account like I talked about a little while ago. Uh, my point is that's one example of what we're starting to see become popular out there on the market. Uh, in product development, we're always looking for to see, you know, what's going to be some good technology we can use so it'll be easier for the customers to do business with us and to use the product so that they won't become uh, victims of fraud. But that's a great question. Uh, another question is for Jeff. Uh, Jeff, what re uh, when Regions clients have been victimized, what are some of the most important things that they need to do first? First thing they need to do is get in touch with their their bank representative. If, if they can go to a branch, talk to the branch manager or someone who can look into their account and then make the call to us so the corporate security can get involved. Is that the, is that, you think that's the answer they're looking for? Yeah, I, I think the first one is the, it, to uh, one of the, the tools that we put in place is to call our, uh, uh, to call our client services group first and, and make sure that, that they are able to, uh, to log that case and get the process right. started. And, and once they get to us, then we can take the ball and run with it. And that's we'll right. make the contacts, we'll help them if they have to complete an affidavit with law enforcement. Whatever we can do to help out to try to get the uh, judicial process taken care of and the investigation started, not only by us, but by the local law enforcement. Right. Uh, another question, Randy, is how does ACH positive pay work? Uh, good question. Um, in fact, so think about when, when I talked about positive pay, um, we, we talked about the three things that we compare to make sure none have been changed. Uh, but it's a little bit different with the ACH positive pay. Again, that's an industry type product that helps a client be, uh, not have losses related to unauthorized debits against their account through ACH. Uh, basically, the way that one works is your bank, or in this case regions, would send you a listing of all the debits through email that posted to your account that previous night. And then the client uh, would have a chance to look at all of those debits and they would say, hey, these are ones that are legitimate, but here's one that is not legitimate. And we would return it back to the bank. In other words, say to the bank, hey, this is not a legitimate debit. Please return it. Keep in mind, the bank, you know, we've got 24 hours. We've got uh, some, uh, some federal regulations that we have to abide by. And so the sooner that the client can let us know that it is an unauthorized debit, then we can return it to the bank of first deposit and they would have to uh, receive it. Uh, Jeff, most of the uh, solutions that I've seen out there in the market, they're pretty flexible in terms of uh, ACH positive pay. The first question clients may ask is, I do not want to receive a notification about all the ACH debits that posted to my account. I only want to see the ones that are above $5,000 or $20,000, whatever the number is. Or we've seen some cases where they say, uh, this particular vendor uh, is only allowed to debit my account once a month. So if they debit my account twice, I want to receive an alert about that one so I will know to receive it. Uh, but over the years, we've seen that that become uh, more and more popular, even growing faster than the paper positive pay because we know that the criminals are pretty uh, swiftly when it comes to using ACH network to try to originate unauthorized ACH debits. So you talked a little bit about dual control. Can yes, you sir. explain a little about how that process works for, uh, for iTreasury and the way that that those permissions can be established within our treasury. Sure, uh, and I'll talk about it at a high level. You know, in most cases here at I, uh, with our treasury, and it may be similar to other banks too. Uh, for a new customer, you know, all of the rights may be given to what we call an admin, uh, and in that particular case, the admin is responsible for assigning rights to other people at their company who would have the ability to originate a wire or an ACH uh, file. Uh, but of course, again, with dual control, like I mentioned earlier, uh, if that admin is going to assign somebody a responsibility for uh, originating a wire, you know, we always recommend that that one person can't complete that entire task uh, because if their credentials are compromised and you've assigned this one person the ability to send a wire transfer from beginning to end, uh, then, of course, the fraudster would compromise that person, log on if they could into whatever that application is, uh, and they'll be able to complete um, that particular task. 
you know, fortunately, you know, several years ago, we moved to an out-of-band authentication uh, process, and most other banks did too. Uh, every now and then, I run into a bank who who still use tokens. Uh, who I remember the tokens with the six-digit, yeah. So we know that those are still used as well. Uh, but fortunately, we moved to out-of-band authentication uh, that makes sure that if there's a person who has the ability to send a wire or ACH, uh, they have to provide some authentication outside of just entering their username and their password. Uh, speaking of passwords, uh, people, of course, nowadays have so many different systems that they log into. Sure. Any suggestions about how to maintain this litany of passwords and the the uh, the any way to manage that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I wish I had a great answer, but I'll tell you what I can say. Uh, here's what we've seen. Um, we've seen some clients who. Who, who did a really good job with passwords. And so a little while ago, I talked about using eight digit afronumeric uh, numbers and all that kind of stuff. And they'd have all these passwords and, and uh, they'd write them on a, put them on a spreadsheet and they'll put a locket with the password, you know, some code or whatever it is to lock that Excel spreadsheet. Uh, then they'll print that spreadsheet out and lay it right on the desk, <laughs> right? And, and, and it's, has anybody doing that? Anybody? None. Uh, so we've seen that, but Jeff, what we've seen uh, work really well lately has been a lot of apps out there uh, that we've heard folks uh, have really good experience with, and a lot of times those apps uh, can't be accessed and using the retina or your fingerprints and things like that, so you can actually get into the phone or get into the application before they can get to that list of passwords. Uh, I don't have any that I would recommend. I recommend anybody do some good research on that, but that seems to have worked uh, pretty well from what I've seen. Um, and I hope that kind of answers your question, but yeah, that, that's a really good question because uh, people have so many passwords that we're trying to keep up with. The question that we also get along that one is they say, hey, do, do you trust when your computer says, do you want me to store this password that you've just created? You know, I'm just not a big fan of that. You know, use the app or try to memorize it. Don't use the spreadsheet, uh, but use something else on those. So, so Jeff, maybe a better answer or person to answer this question. If I pay the, the ransom, relative to ransomware, what guarantee do I have that they will release my data? Now, that's a great question, and I should have mentioned this in, in my presentation. Before you pay that ransom, you need to make sure that you are in communication with the person that's making the demand and make sure you are 100% sure that they can release that information, release that data. And there are ways that they can say, here's an example of how I can get the data back to you. So, but you do need to verify that they are going to give you that that what they are providing you will unlock the data. No, that's a great question. And can you explain, Randy, a, a kind of the difference between the relationship between malware and business email compromise, that, that while they are connected, you can still be a victim of business email compromise without having malware on your, on your computer? Sure, uh, I'll definitely try. Uh, the magic with business email compromise isn't always so much about putting malware on your computer, but it's actually uh, acting on our human instincts. And so in some cases we've seen where with business email compromise where a fraudster could, uh, for example, hack into the email system of your vendor and send an email to you at your company or somebody at your company and say, hey, we have a new banking relationship. All future payments need to come to this bank uh, routing transit number and this account. Now, keep in mind, even in that particular case, you're the customer. Malware is not on your computer. It may be on the computers of your vendors, but they're acting on, acting on our human tendencies by sending an email to you and you react to it. Now, to add on to that a little bit, Jeff, a lot of people became really aware of what was going on. And so what we saw the fraudsters start doing in those cases where they actually hacked into an email application that could be owned by our vendor, we've seen them actually monitor email traffic between your company and one of your vendor for weeks and months in some cases before they would actually interject themselves into the conversation. So think about this. If you're talking to one of your vendors and you know you say, hey, we're going to send a payment soon for the inventory that we bought. We got a game this weekend. I hope your team wins. Uh, how are the kids? All those types of things. And that's fine. A uh, couple, three weeks go by and you've had this type of conversation back and forth with somebody at this vendor company that you worked with for a long time and then the vendor sends an email to you saying, hey, by the way, we have a new banking relationship. Here's the new payment information. 
And by the way, I saw the game last week. Y'all did really good. This sounds just like somebody that you talk to, you know, really well on a regular basis through email. And they say, here's my new banking information. So you go ahead and you change that information without even questioning it, without picking up the phone to call them or checking the email uh, like Jeff was just talking about earlier. And you would do that. With all that being said, those are cases where you as a client don't necessarily have malware on your computer or on your servers, but you have a fraudster who is smart enough to play on our human tendencies and they can figure out a way to get you to begin sending money to their account in the future. And, and let me just say this, I know we're wrapping up. From what we've seen, a, a lot of times when that takes place, the client may not realize that they've been sending money to the wrong account until 60 or 90 days pass. So think about that. So you, you sent, you've been sending your money, you made the payment changes, okay, and it's 30 days, and then it goes 60 days, and this friendly vendor that I was just talking about says, well, they always pay on time, it's been 60 days, I'll give them another week or two. Then, you know, 80 days go by, and you call them up, your vendor calls you and say, hey, we didn't receive that payment for the inventory that we bought three months ago. And they say, sure I did. We sent it to you just like we always did. In fact, we sent it to that new bank that you're banking with. And at that point, they realized that they've been sending that money to the vendor, at least to the fraudster, and they start getting into a big rush, you know, want to get all the other guys involved to try and track that money down. But who knows, that money could be in China or Russia somewhere uh, by that time. But again, about 60 to 90 days before they realize it. And the scary part is those guys could actually watch that communication, that email traffic that's taking place before they interject themselves into the uh, conversation. So any other questions from the audience that, uh, that we want to try to take today? Well, let me thank you. My name is Jeff Taylor. Uh, let me thank you so much for your, for your time today, for you investing your time uh, in this threat. We have a lot of opportunity that, uh, that is available to you on our uh, vanity page called regions.com slash stop fraud. If you want to go to that page, look at the videos that we have there, look at the information that, uh, that we have available to you that you can share within your groups and with your, uh, the folks in your company. Education and awareness is the most important thing. By you being here today, you've taken that first step toward uh, creating a ripple effect of education amongst uh, the folks in your organization. So thank you again so much for being here. If you have any questions, please direct those to your local treasury management officer uh, or uh, let us know and we're happy to help and, and do anything we can to help you. Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. Sure. Any suggestions on how to verify the legitimacy of a vendor other than utilizing the IRS's TIM matching system? You mentioned that as one of the precautions yeah. to, uh, for prevention. Yeah, well, from the legitimacy of the vendor, I mean, I think that's a good way. You know, I think, I think, what, I think, I think the best thing that, that I've seen taking place is, is, again, just have a good program in place for that. You know, meeting with, the, particularly the new vendors, meeting with them, in some cases face-to-face, -face, uh, doing all the normal due diligence that you would do on a vendor, making sure that there is, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. making sure making sure that there is somebody who is responsible for managing that particular vendor relationship making sure that that vendor's relationship is evaluated at least annually based on the spend that you have with that vendor it may need to take place on a quarterly basis uh, we know that things happen to different companies you know their financiers could get uh, in a negative position we know that management and leadership could change a lot of types of things that may point that fact that you may not want to do business with that vendor again or it may point to the fact that they do, could be doing some fraudulent things so not only creating the relationship with them but the ongoing monitoring of that vendor is very critical you're welcome Thank you again for being here. Have a great rest of your day.